Welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to the traumatherapistproject.com. That's the traumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. All right, Jamie, you ready? I'm ready. All right. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. Very excited to have back Dr. Jamie Marriage. Jamie, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. So Jamie describes herself as a facilitator of transformative experiences. She's the founder of the Institute for Creative Mindfulness, a clinical trauma specialist, expressive artist, writer, yogini, performer, short filmmaker, Reiki master, TEDx speaker, and recovery advocate. She unites all these elements in her mission to inspire healing in others. Jamie began her career as a humanitarian aid worker in Bosnia, Herzegovina, primarily teaching English. She now travels internationally teaching on topics related to trauma, EMDR, expressive arts, mindfulness, and yoga while maintaining a private practice in Northeast Ohio. She's the author of several books. Her new book comes out in January, Dissociation Made Simple, a stigma-free guide to embracing your dissociative mind and navigating daily life. Welcome back. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So look, reading through this book, I'm going to get it right into it here. There's something that pops out to me, and that is, and correct me if I'm wrong, give me your thoughts on this. And it's kind of even in the title of this book here, you want to, uh, there's an energy behind not just what you do and all the things you do, but it's almost as if you're saying, folks, let's get friggin' real. Let's bring our understanding of what's going on in the mental health space up to current life where we are. There's a sense that there are a lot of old models being used out there. Uh, people are interpreting them in a kind of an old fashioned way. That's not only isn't it honoring who we are, but it's negatively impacting the understanding that people have about themselves. I think you embrace the point of the book, which is let's get real. And something that I try to do with my narrative voice in this book is to speak more as Jamie and not just as Dr. Jamie, because even when you introduced me for the podcast, I know the bio, I know the press bio, I hear it read so many times when the I present bio, right? when I'm on podcasts and it's like, great, that's Dr. Jamie. And if that gives me the credibility for people to listen to me, cool. But as I discuss in the book, I'm writing this book more so as Jamie, Jamie, who is a person with dissociative identities, who has a system who, yes, informs a lot of how Dr. Jamie teaches, but I really wanted the real voice of me to shine in this, and I'm hoping to inspire other clinicians to do the same, and the general public to do the same. And there's, and I sense that, and, and but there's a reason behind that. Yes. And now, what is that reason? I'm sick of hearing the way fellow clinicians talk about dissociation. That's the blunt reason. That's the answer. Okay, lay it out. Yeah. So many years ago, at the beginning of my career as a trauma therapist, especially getting trained in EMDR therapy and going to the conferences, I knew at that point that I was a person with a dissociative system. I was diagnosed with previous to OSDD, dissociative disorder, NOS in 2004. And so I wanted to absorb everything I could about dissociation from an intellectual perspective, from a trauma perspective. But guy, I went to every conference, every training, and I sat through the talks on dissociation and I was either dissociated because I was so upset by how we were being talked about, or I was just quite frankly, very angry that diso- I, I, the, the overwhelming feeling I had was you're making this more complicated than it needs to be. 
And I think a lot of that complication that presenters come at dissociation with does come from an honorable place of we have to legitimize DID, formerly multiple personality disorders, as a real thing. We have to really kind of lead with the science on this. But I feel that a lot of that kind of overdoing it, trying too hard, has had the opposite effect with practicing clinicians, which is to make them afraid of dissociation. Mm -hmm. And I, even in, in trauma circles and EMDR therapy circles, I still hear people say things like, I know I can't let my client dissociate, or if they have a certain score on this particular inventory, I can't go forward with treatment or this assumption that dissociation is always a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And as one of the chapters in the new book boldly states, dissociation is not a dirty word. Mm -hmm. It's not inherently a pathological construct. And I want to try to get professionals and the public to open up their mind a little more about this. This is interesting because, you know, there's there's this uh, common uh, understanding that in our uh, cultural in our culture, broadly, there's a fear and misunderstanding of trauma in general. Correct. Right. So within the subset of that practicing clinicians and even further trauma specialists you're saying that there's 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 an overcomplication of dissociation why why is that my short blunt answer to that is i don't think we understand our own because a point of the book, a point of my teaching is that we all dissociate, that dissociation is as common to the human experience as trauma is. I think it has, media has not helped with this, mm -hmm. that it has been portrayed in such dramatic, violent terms that I think we have a, oh, don't touch or it's automatically a bad thing type of association. That's part of it. I don't think there's any one explanatory reason. Uh, I think our culture, especially Western culture, leverages dissociation so much with us that a lot of the powers that be want us to stay dissociated from our feelings mm -hmm. so that we can consume more, that we can be more separated from each other. That that could be another explanatory reason. I think the other factor, especially with clinicians, is dissociation is not just one thing. Because even at the beginning of my career, I, I had this sense of, well, is dissociation this thing I do where I get floaty and drifty in the present moment? Or is it the fact that I have parts? Like, which is it? And in the book, I explore a little bit of the origin story of even how we started to use the word dissociation as a psychological profession. But then I also go to the perspectives of some healers and shamans from indigenous perspectives to see kind of what inquiry that existed before Western psychology can teach us about this. And I think another causal factor here is, and I explain this in the book, it was not, and we share about this a lot, that graduate programs don't really mention trauma. I mean, I think there's some seeds of hope springing up in certain trauma programs, but mm -hmm. I remember the only exposure I had to dissociation in graduate school was, yeah, there's this condition that's technically in the DSM called DID, formerly multiple personality disorders, but it's so rare. You're never going to see it in your clinical setting. Only 200 people in all of human history have been documented to have it. Like they totally pulled that number out of wherever. And that was in 2004, but I still have students I mentor now who have been taught that in recent years in graduate mm -hmm. school. So I, I think a lot of it's just general misunderstanding, misinformation. And I think, as you know, with the work you do, a lot of it is just the field we ha the fear we have mm -hmm. of our own trauma or our own dissociation not being addressed. How challenging slash um, scary of a decision was it for you to, I mean, you talked about uh, quote unquote, coming out in terms of right. other issues of your of your life, mm -hmm. but how to what degree was that still there to in this book for you to say yeah. you know what, hello, this is this is me. Well, it's been a gradual process for me right. that I think I've had with every year of my professional existence. I have felt more and more emboldened to come out because it has, like I said, been a gradual process. I've generally had more positive reception to it than negative reception. 
in my first Made Simple book, EMDR Made Simple, I remember that was when I dipped my toes in the public water. I think by saying something like, I struggle with dissociation as part of my complex trauma presentation. And then in 2018, I wrote the big article basically saying that, yes, I'm a person with a system who does this work. And I'm, I can no longer teach on this until I could talk about it this candidly. And mm -hmm. I think that was my motivating factor that in EMDR circles, I'd get so many folks saying, when are you going to do a course on dissociation? And my simple answer was, I can't do it until I feel comfortable enough to be this candid, to say I'm a system. So much of what I know is born from really hard personal experience interfacing with others in the community. I respect the science that's being done, a lot of the scholarship that's being done, but I don't think that's how we best understand dissociation. So in the last several years, just getting a lot of good support from colleagues about being out and visible, I just knew it was the time to really put this out in book form now. It's a very interesting uh, book because it feels to me like you're, you, you've you got this, I don't want to have negative connotations, but it just feels like you've got this giant, like Japanese sword and you're going, <laughs> take that, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, research into DID and then you're coming backwards. Mm -hmm. Take that culture about how you don't understand people with this mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's a it's a powerful statement and i think you you know i look i interview a lot of people you're doing something with not only the work you do but i think how you're presenting it and who you are that is not it, it, it's it's almost like a wake-up call it's a refreshing wake-up call thank you Thank you for seeing that. Thank you for acknowledging it as such. And to that, I want to be clear. I don't disparage people who are doing the research and the science because that has been needed to prove our legitimacy. Right. I, I don't disparage the people who are out there. Like the example I always use is in the IFS community showing that like we all have parts, we all, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think those those models are good to have mm -hmm. out there, but I have felt too often there has been an exclusion of the lived experience of people with dissociative identities. And that is something I really hoped to amplify in this book. What do you, what, oh, just to go back to your point, mm -hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't mean to imply that you were disparaging. Yeah. Just that right. I didn't get that either. Making mm -hmm. these 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 pronouncements that right. uh, we don't often don't hear, but what do you be more specific about what you mean by the exclusion in IFS, for example? So an example that I use in the book that has really been a, a, a sore point for a lot of us in dissociative identities communities uh, is Frank Anderson, who's a senior trainer in IFS. I don't know. You may have even interviewed him. On I, this. I have. Yep. Yeah, but in, in his book from 2021, he has a line that says people with dissociative identity disorder are masters of deception. And a lot of people I've talked to in IFS world have tried to like IFS speak it to me, but those of us with dissociative identities or DID really hear that as a brutal insult. Uh, there's another book called Your Symphony of Selves by Gruber and Fadiman, which is very much the whole, oh, we all have parts, but you're not like those people with DID. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. And even reading that book, on one hand, I like what they're doing, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, there is an edge mm -hmm. that says, you know, you don't have to pathologize yourself. It's, mm -hmm. it's okay. And my response is, well, a lot of us with dissociative identities, we don't pathologize ourselves either. But mm -hmm. when you put it out in language like that, it it really makes us feel a certain kind of way. And mm -hmm. I just think it's high time that in this work about parts and dissociation, that a lot of us with the experiences of being both professionals who live with dissociative identity start speaking out because mm -hmm. we have a lot to say, but there's still a lot of fear about speaking as publicly as I am. Right. Right. A uh, fear that you're going to be looked at as crazy, a, a ma crazy, a master, a master of deception, <laughs> a master of deception. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And Mm -hmm. I know one of the first books I read that impacted me so deeply as a professional was Kay Redfield Jameson's An Unquiet Mind. And she wrote it in 1995 as a psychologist who I believe taught at Johns Hopkins in their psychiatry department. So very learned, very published in the mental health field, in the field of bipolar disorder. And she came out with her memoir saying, hey, I'm also a person with bipolar disorder. And I remember reading that and being so impacted by it. Because she said, I knew as soon as I came out, people would start challenging me. Like, is Mm -hmm. her research legit? Is she unhinged? Does she have an agenda? I mean, something I get all the time is that I have poor boundaries. And I've learned that you can still have good, appropriate boundaries and especially therapeutic boundaries, yet also know where your your vulnerability is a strength. Mm -hmm. And I think you know this about me, that I feel smashing stigma has to be paramount to what we do as mental health professionals and nothing mm, ingrains stigma more than us having this us versus them kind of Mm -hmm. mentality that, oh, here are the people over here that we treat. And here are those of us as the professionals who should have it all together. And, you know, BS. I think the latest actual peer-reviewed study I read on this in preparing a presentation said something like 48% of people who work in mental health have a diagnosis themselves or had (laughs) at one point in their life. I I would say it's probably larger than that. Oh, come on. For sure. (laughs) You and I both know, you know, uh, everyone's got something going on. Mm -hmm. uh, If you look at it on a continuum and you, I I completely agree with you. Um, This, this idea that uh, there is this us versus them. I have the knowledge. I am going to treat you and help you and inform you is uh, not only detrimental and hurtful, but it, it, it continues to promote and enforce a, a type of stigma. This is very interesting to me that you're doing this. And I think it's, you know, it, it's interesting because, and I'm picking this out of, of this whole book because I think it's so important. And I, and I'm, I, 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 hope you know how important it is because all these interviews I do this thread it's almost like I have to pull this out of people oh, wow. you know and and you are here you're saying look I'm a fucking person and yeah. this is what I'm going through and this is what I'm doing and let's 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 get together you're bringing people together and it's so empower empowering Thank you for validating that. Thank you yeah. for acknowledging that. Well, I because... think it's, I think it's, 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 it's where things need to go. Mm-hmm. So yes, agreed, a hundred percent. And I'm glad you picked up on that. Uh, something else I wanted to add about the book that that interfaces with this point is it's not just my voice and my story. I interviewed sixty one other people in this. Some are other professionals who I really admire, who I believe really get it. And by I mean, get it. Let me explain my definition of that. My four-year-old part feels safe with them. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not necessarily the big names. My four-year-old part feels safe with. And one of the contributors I had a chance to interview, I only met her through this project, is a professional with DID who's in recent years come out about her experience, you know, brilliant clinician from Massachusetts named Melissa Parker. And she said, Our stories have been told by people who know nothing about us. And that's why I'm coming forward to talk to you for Mm -hmm. this. And that's, that's part of the paradigm shift. I want to see happen is yes, it's awesome when people share lived experience, period. Something just really gave me chills in putting this book together about the professionals I talked to Mm -hmm. who shared their lived experience as well. How did you find those people? Yeah, a combination of factors. Some people I, I I put together like a call for interview, like you would for any other research study. And I some people I did directly approach thinking I would really like to get your story for this. Some said yes, many said no. And then I put out a general call just in the social media circles, the clinician list mm-hmm. service serves I, I interface with. And I probably had about 85 people respond initially then a couple people said it wasn't for them when they read a little bit more about the larger project and so when it came down to it 61 people ended up talking to me and I did those interviews over a period of about three months last year and then really kind of let it sit and marinate 
And I used a phenomenological interviewing style, which is the kind of research I am trained in. And so all of the contributors were asked the same 10 questions, but I definitely didn't present it in a way that would be a pure peer reviewed study where I would bracket my own bias away and Mm -hmm. kind of take myself out of the process. So I did present it more like a narrative form, even though the questioning I used was very uh, standardized in talking to uh, the 61 folks that, that were willing to speak to me. So I'm speaking with Dr. Jamie Marriage. The book is called Association Made Simple, A Stigma-Free Guide to Embracing Your Associative Mind and Navigating Daily Life. The book comes out January, what is it, 10th? January January 10th, 2023. January. Okay. Yeah, from North Atlantic Books. Um, what's what's also interesting to me in, in the book, you know, you, you, you uh, reference indigenous cultures and, and their views on this. What did you learn from that? Oh my goodness. What didn't I learn? Uh, One of the reasons I really reached out to indigenous folks to contribute for this is this longstanding belief I've had that Western psychology does not have it figured out. In fact, I think we muck it up in a lot of ways. (laughs) And, uh, you know, one of the contributors I spoke to is a, as an Ecuadorian shaman, named Julian Jaramillo, who is also trained as a Jungian depth analyst. So he really had <laughs> wow. a reflection be- between the two perspectives. And something he really shared with me is how in the shamanic system in which he's trained, he's properly ordained in an Ecuadorian tradition, um, there's this belief that our personal mythology, our story, is really what is the most healing avenue. And when a shaman works with a person who is ailed in any way, that's one of the things they look at. What are the mythologies of the people Mm. you come from and how can we leverage those stories? This is why with my clients, instead of using Fraser's table, we're often using like Marvel movies and fictional Mm -hmm. characters and archetypes. And this is why I still think Jungian archetypes, if we're looking at Western psychology, is still one of the most beautiful ways we have to work with parts. But something Julian said is that my shaman in referencing his shaman, the man who ordained him, he doesn't even know what a brain is. And in modern therapy, we're so fixated on, well, we have to prove these things work by showing the neuroscience. Again, Mm -hmm. not disparaging that. I know that's helpful to a lot of people, but I can get in this place where I see all of the courses being done on neuroscience and neurobiology feeling like, "Mm, I but, but does that really make you a better therapist or are you missing the point by worrying so much about what the brain is doing and you're missing the human connection right. in front of you? And something I share with my EMDR students all the time is I'll teach you neurobiology to the level of like what you would need to drive a car. Like here's the transmission, here's the steering wheel, here are the brakes, but you have to actually drive to learn how to be a good driver. Getting Mm -hmm. under the hood and learning how every little thing works is not necessarily going to make you a good driver. And I'm, I'm a bit fringe for having that opinion as a trauma therapist in the modern era where everybody's so hung up on the neuroscience. And so when Julian said that, that my, my, my shaman wouldn't even know what a brain is. Mm -hmm. It was just very validating to me that there's something bigger and even spiritual and more humanistic about the way we understand people that's at play. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, who's the book for? Well, I know publishers hate when you say it's for everybody, Mm -hmm. but in this, in this case, my publisher really gave me the green light to write this book for the general public. I have an appendix for clinicians. I have an appendix for people who are loved ones and supporters of those who struggle with dissociation. But something I say in those appendices is I want you to read this book for yourself first, Mm -hmm. because probably the greatest failure I've seen in dissociation education amongst clinicians is I'm teaching you, I'm giving you a course on how to work with your clients, but it has to first start with therapist know thyself, Mm -hmm. especially as it relates to trauma and dissociation. So for that, the book really is for anybody who's wanting to know more about what this, what is this word? Is it dissociation? Is it disassociation? I hear it talked about a lot more nowadays, but what is it really? Mm -hmm. So I've, I've written the book for anybody who wants to know more 
And I hope that clinicians will start with themselves first. When, how, how do you answer that question? What is association? So the simple answer is, I always go to word origin. You know, you read it in my bio. I started as an English teacher. So the English word dissociation comes from the Latin root dissociatio, meaning to sever or to separate. And I think in that word origin lies our key to understanding it, that dissociation is any activity that we engage in that severs or separates us from the present moment, because the present moment is too unpleasant to stay in, unpleasant, hurtful, painful, or it's any separation that occurs within. And there's a lot of ways to look at that. Like, mm -hmm. Is it the biggest self? Is it, you know, the fact that we were born separated and we're initially supposed to integrate in, in the scope of good development? You know, whatever model you're looking at as an explanation, there's a severing that happens within. For some of us, it's more drastic. For other people, it's more subtle. And then dissociation, if we're understanding it as a severing or a separation, there's generally one of two reasons why it happens to either meet a need or to protect the self. And that can also be implied as to protect the system mm -hmm. as well, uh, a system of selves. So that's my kind of made simple platform off which I build this, you know, knowing that there's a lot of things dissociate, well, a lot of ways it can show up. There's mm -hmm. a lot of ways to understand it, to explain it. But if we're really looking at where do we begin, if you could understand it's severing or separation, that gives you a lot of the key to understanding your own and others. Oh, do you still feel hesitation as, as you talk about this, your own experience? Not at all. Not at all. Uh, no. And, and it's, it's interesting because I think, again, that's an emboldening that has come from now four years of being really fully out 12 years of dipping my toes out. Mm. And even though I know there's some criticism about the approach I take, the amount of gratitude I've received, especially from other dissociative therapists, has helped me know I'm doing the right thing. Right. I remember one of the first times I was this bold in a public seminar it was just like a general trauma 101 I was doing. And I kind of read the energy of the room, the space to know how much I could go there. At least at that point, I did more of that. And after the presentation, a, a person comes up to me and says, I cannot believe a presenter at a podium was that candid about her experiences with a dissociative system. And it was not meant to be a slam. Like I did not interpret it at that as any way. It was just, I can't believe it. And wow, like it's finally happening. And, you know, the amount of professionals I've had who have come out to me over the years. And eventually some end up coming out publicly, some don't, and that's on them to decide if it's safe enough where they work to do right, that. Right. But those, that that's the reason I do this. And I remember one of the, you know, core experiences of my life with this, I was speaking at a major international conference, uh, telling my story and afterwards in the question and answers, I'll keep names out of it, but one real official type in the dissociation community just kind of had a lot of attacking, biting questions for me. And I believe mm -hmm. I answered it fine, basically disparaging the fact that I was so personal and not citing people enough. And afterwards, I was a little rattled, but still happy with how I handled it. Um, another person in the audience came up to me, came up to us and said, my people see your people. Mm -hmm. And I, we want to thank you for that. And I just started crying and I hugged mm -hmm. her and it's like, I mm -hmm. could care less what the establishment says at this point, if that's the kind of hope I can engender for other clinicians who are plural. Well, I, I think that's awesome. And I, I mean, I applaud you for doing that. And I think, you know, on, on one hand, someone might argue do whatever you're going to do, you know, mm -hmm. you, and, and that's fine. But the issue is that I think what you're doing, your, your courage to share your experience does serve to destigmatize. And I think the opposite almost serves to perpetuate 
stigma and perpetuate this kind of us versus them mentality, right? Nothing's wrong with me. I got mm-hmm. the degree. I'm here to help you, you know? You got it. <laughs> you got yeah. it. And I, I just have chills, Guy, because I respect you so much and what you do in this field. The fact that you read this work and are really getting what, you know, I and we and others like us are trying to do. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, it's to me, it's 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 what I hope my podcast is about. Um, and I, I'm I'm very excited for this to get out there. Again, the book is called Dissociation Made Simple, a stigma-free guide to embracing your dissociative mind and navigating daily life. Um, this will be out January 10th. So what are we looking at here in terms of format? Like Kindle, hardcover, softcover, what? It's out in everything. And this was the first book I got to audio narrate myself. Oh, cool. Very cool. Uh, yeah. Honestly, a couple of my other books have audiobooks, and I just didn't have the time to right. narrate them myself. And I knew voice talent needed the work. Yet I said, I need to do this one myself. It's that personal. Awesome. And so that was an interesting experience. So it's also out on audiobook. Uh, basically, wherever books are sold, you can find it. Awesome. All right, Dr. Jamie, what is the best way for people to get in contact with you? So especially since we've talked so much about the book, I want to direct you to the website, redefinetherapy.com. Redefine therapy is a hashtag I've used for many years, and we've now set it up as the official website for this book and some other projects that'll be related. So uh, you can obviously Google my name, jamiemarich.com. I have a website, Institute for Creative Mindfulness is my company. But if you're really hungry for more on what we talked about in this podcast today, I'd send folks to redefinetherapy.com. I'm on all the socials. You can search my name. And I also have a new handle called Trauma Therapist Rants. It's on TikTok and Instagram. Basically more of this edgier me Mm -hmm. uh, coming out in that format. Awesome. All right, Jamie. Awesome. I'm so excited for you. And uh, it's uh, your your breath of fresh air in, in this profession. I appreciate you. Take care. Thank you, Guy. I want to thank you so much for listening to this podcast. And I want to let you know that I am very excited about my new podcast, The Right Now Project. The Right Now Project is about healing. It's about stepping into our own courage and authenticity and getting started or continuing along our healing process. We're all going through something, whatever it is, in this crazy life we're living. And the Right Now Project is about honoring that, celebrating that, and sharing our stories via the associated membership site. Check us out at therightnowproject.com, therightnowproject.com.